and we should be good. Good morning, everyone. My name is John D'Antona, and I'm the Director of Marketing here at Capus. Welcome to our monthly research call. On behalf of Capus, I would like to thank everyone for taking the time out of your busy trading day to spend with us. We hope that you find the following information in today's call useful. In order for us to serve you better, there is a brief survey at the conclusion of the call that we'd appreciate you all filling out. Thank you very much. But before we get started, let me go through the legalese. The opinions expressed by the featured speakers are neither those of Capital Institutional Services nor its employees. The presentation is not, and nothing in it should be construed as, an offer to uh, recommendation to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any securities that might be mentioned. And now, on with the call. First up to speak with us is, uh, and give us a market update on Capus and its operations is David Cho, our COO and Executive Director of Sales and Trading here at Capus. Dave? Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks, John. I just wanted to give you a couple minutes on the, the events in Dallas, Texas. We've been in the news a little bit over the last couple of weeks. You may have seen that we've had below freezing temperatures and for those, those folks up north, that's probably no big deal. But what happened with us, as you've probably seen, is we had power outages. So our power grid apparently failed to, to, to be able to accommodate our, our population. So that has caused some major issues in Dallas, right? We, we, and, and also in other parts of Texas. But we've seen some people have had rolling blackouts. By rolling, they've literally been on power for two hours, off power for two hours, on power for two hours, off. Others, like my house, half the day, every night at about midnight, we're out of power till the next morning at about 10 a.m. So go 10 hours in eight degree temperature with no power and see how that works. Uh, others have had no problems. Simply, they're either on a, on a grid that's next to a hospital or next to a fire station, and they haven't gone out at all. And, uh, and then we, of course, had some folks whose power has been off for uh, multiple days now in this, in this cold weather. So it's causing problems, it's causing pipes to burst, and it's calling, I know it's poor people with, uh, with pools in Dallas, Texas, uh, those pools and bumps and things are being destroyed. So the never off is the key. Can you be in a district that's never off? And that comes to Capus, just to give you guys a, an understanding of where we are. I'm in the downtown business district. This is our corporate office. Downtown business district has never been part of these rolling blackouts. We have had them in the summer before when, when power uh, supplies were not enough to, uh, to, to cool everyone. The business district is secure. Power has not gone off. Capus is, is up and running. A number of our employees are staying downtown and, li and or live downtown, so getting to the office is easy. And others are working remotely as they have been for the last year. The two data centers that support us, one is in the old Dallas Fed here downtown in the business district, no power issues. And the other is on a grid uh, up in Richardson, Texas that, uh, uh, that has also been, uh, been powered the entire time. So from a CAPAS perspective, we're here, trading's up, everything's been working real well and if you get a chance over the next few days to thank an IT professional do so without them this all wouldn't have been possible and last if you know any good plumbers send them to Texas because we have needs and with that John I'll give it back to you thank you Dave for providing us with that update and yes plumbers are needed and now I'd like to turn it over to Nick Colas. But before I do, just as a reminder, Nick will take questions at the conclusion of his remarks. I'd ask you to please type them into the Q&A portion of your Zoom and I will be sure to get to them. Before we go, Nick Colas is one of the two founders of Datatrek, a research firm focusing on market fundamentals designed to make the investment process more profitable, robust, and efficient. Nick is a 30 plus year veteran of Wall Street with experience in equity research, money management, and investment banking. From 1991 to 99, he was a senior equity auto analyst at First Boston, 
which we know as now Credit Suisse. From 99 to 2001, he was an analyst and portfolio manager at SAC Capital. And most recently, Nick was director of research and chief market strategist for First Rochelle Securities and then Convergex. Nick, welcome. Thank you so much. Just to do an audio check, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you both uh, for, the, for the lead in. Uh, and Dave, hope things continue to uh, you know, be productive at Capus. You, know, you guys work very hard and I'm sure the clients really respect it and, and, and are very thankful for it. So best of luck. Uh, let's start off with the conversation now. The topic that uh, John wanted me to cover that I think is really an excellent one is basically what does politics mean to the stock market? And I'm going to format this conversation today uh, in terms of five questions and answers. And these are questions that we get from clients at DataTrack literally on a daily basis. And I want to go through our responses to them that we've given them in our written work and give them to you in summary form today. Let me just start with a quick preamble um, because this is also something that we hear from clients a lot. Politics is a hugely contentious issue in the US and it's really even not just here. If you think about Brexit or the far right in Europe or what's going on in Hong Kong, politics drives a lot of emotion, a lot of interest and it's become a very difficult topic to discuss. Our approach and the one we're gonna take today is just to focus on what politics means to making money in capital markets and nothing else. We don't judge things as good or bad or productive or unproductive. The focus today is purely on what government does and doesn't do that helps or hurts asset prices. And that's it, pure and simple. So with that preamble out of the way, let me kind of move on to the format we discussed, which is Q&A. So the first question and probably the question we get most often is, what does history say about US stock market returns when one party controls Congress and the White House? Because it's not that common. We usually have split governments. Uh, looking at the math back to 1948, when the Democrats control Congress and the White House, the average S&P returns about 14%. 14.1. And the average return when Republicans hold the White House and all of Congress is 16%. Those two 14 and 16% comps look at an average over the same period of just 10.8% in total. So the bottom line is that it's okay to have one party or the other control the whole package. Now, there's a mantra that's gone around for a long time that gridlock is good for markets. And I think that goes back to the 1980s when I started in the business. The thought process was well, you had Reagan and Tip O'Neill and that kind of gridlock and give and take really forced the best legislation through the process. And that's why stock returns were so good in the 80s. I think that's the genesis of the gridlock is good kind of idea, which I've just kind of shown you is actually not all that true. Because in hindsight, when we think about the 80s, the real issue with stocks and why stocks did so well wasn't politics at all. It was the fact that the Fed dropped rates from 15% in 82 to 66 and 7% in 1987. And that's what really helped bond and stock returns tremendously. There were a bunch of other factors, but if you want to isolate one reason why the 80s was so good for US stocks, it wasn't gridlock in Washington. It was just Paul Volcker having beaten inflation in 81 and being able to take rates down over the subsequent years. So the takeaway from that first set of comments is when one party essentially controls the executive legislative branches, they have every incentive to get things basically right for the economy, for constituents, and so forth. So it's okay that Democrats control both House, Senate, and White House. The second takeaway though, and this is important because we're gonna come back to it, is DC is already focused on the 2022 elections. Because remember that the par president's party tends to lose seats in the house during midterms. And Republicans are thinking that's gonna be their opportunity. And you see this in the wrangling around the next stimulus package. Essentially, both parties know that the better the economy is in the back half of this year and next year, the better the chances the Democrats have of holding on to the House and Senate in 2022. So it's always hard to think in Wall Street terms, which are kind of month by month and quarter by quarter, and compare that to the legislative process, which tends to go around two-year cycles around House elections. But it's really important to understand that's the way DC thinks. And for those of you that have had a chance to spend time with lawmakers, 
uh, you'll understand this phenomenon, but it's really weird when you think about it as an investor that you've got to think two years out the way a politician does if you want to understand politics and how it affects things like the stock market. So that's number one. Question number two, and we've done a lot of work on this because clients really were asking for color on this at the beginning of the year. How will fiscal and monetary policy affect inflation and stock returns, particularly inflation? Huge topic. And to answer this, let me take you back for a second to the 1960s, because it really is in many ways the most analogous period. If you look at a long run chart of the CPI, you'll find that inflation was basically 1% from 59 to 65. There was no inflation in the US. Even though we had a very high levels of GDP growth, inflation was very quiet very, very good time in terms of overall asset price returns. The stock market did well, inflation was low, things were fine. Very much like the last five years pre-COVID when inflation was running low and stock returns were pretty good. Now, what happened in the late 60s is you had two things. The first was the Vietnam War. The second was Johnson's Great Society initiatives to basically try to, um, try to improve what was a lot of wealth inequality and income inequality in the US based around race. And as a result, you got, began to get inflation because you had fiscal spending from the war and from great society programs. And that began to spoon up inflation. By 1970, inflation was 6%. Now the Fed at that point should have stepped in and they began to, but in 73, we got the first oil shock. And that drove inflation much higher and you know, unemployment much higher. And the Fed was really stuck in between a rock and a hard place. They didn't want to be seen as being constraining the country's ability to recover from the oil shock, but they knew inflation was a problem. And so they split the difference. They didn't raise rates enough. And that's how you ended up with very high inflation in the late seventies at the second oil shock and why Paul Volcker came in and was forced to create a recession to dampen inflation. Now that's a long kind of narrative, but just think about the comparisons to today. You have the COVID pandemic, huge stressor on the economy, obviously. The Fed doesn't wanna be seen as being against the US economy, against the US workers. So they're gonna keep rates extremely low. You have a lot of fiscal stimulus, just like you had great society spending in the late sixties. And this is why I think a lot of people, particularly with a long memory or who know their history, look at the current period as a real potential turning point for inflation. And I totally get that. And uh, we expect inflation to rise. We do expect inflation to go over 2% and stay there. But we also expect the Fed to do exactly what it did in the 70s and not try to constrain the economy too soon because they want to see the economy get back to full employment. And this isn't just um, Jay Powell at the Fed. It's also Janet Yellen at Treasury. She's a labor economist by training. She was Fed chair. She understands all these dynamics and she's going to push very hard to try to get the economy back to full steam as fast as possible, even if it causes inflation. So what are the investment takeaways? Investment takeaway number one, as much as you can possibly be, don't be long, long duration bonds. They're just going to get crushed. That's a problem. Uh, it's a problem because you have not that many hedges for the stock market, but it's gonna be a very costly hedge if you're putting on 20 year paper, 30 year treasury paper as a hedge against stock market performance. Just keep in mind that the inflation break even is on tips right now are running 2.2 to 2.4% for 10 and five year tips. And obviously real rates, nominal rates are not that high. So you are gonna see a backup in yields. In fact, the situation is a little bit worse than it was during the 1970s when we had high inflation because the coupons are so much lower that the durations are so much longer that you're gonna get hurt more with bonds now than you did in the 70s. Now, the third takeaway from this is it is going to help the economy. All this stimulus is going to help the economy. If you look at the retail sales data yesterday, it was very clear. It looks like about a third of those $600 checks got spent in January. And that was good for home retailers, good for car retailers. The stimulus is helping the economy. It is doing what it's supposed to do. It just comes at eventually a higher price of higher inflation. So that's the takeaway from that. Question number three, and Jessica, my, my business partner, does a lot of work on this topic is government regulation and big tech. You know, if you look at big tech, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google, they're 22% of the S&P. If they were a sector, only technology itself would be a bigger sector. They're bigger than healthcare, bigger than financials. It's a huge slug of the S&P. So focusing on this is important. 
the most at risk company to regulation is clearly Facebook. As a matter of fact, we did a survey of our readers and clients last month and asked them of all the names at the top of the S&P right now, which do you think is least likely to be in the S&P at the top level in 10 years time? Meaning which one's going to just kind of erode and go away from the top listing the way, say, an ExxonMobil did over the last 10 years. Facebook was their number one choice by a wide margin. This is a, this is a stock that is basically troubled because of the regulatory overhang in large part. And as a matter of fact, it hasn't gone anywhere since August 2020. The stock's been kind of flat. Amazon's been kind of like that as well, which shows you that there was probably some rotation out of these names, but the regulatory overhang on an Amazon, on a Facebook is an issue. Now, it's less of an issue for Google. Google's made a new high recently, and it's really no issue at all for Apple and Microsoft. So you have to take this issue kind of name by name. The takeaway on this is kind of twofold. The first is we're not particularly concerned about regulatory issues and these companies in terms of really affecting their stock prices. These companies have the multiples they do because they innovate. And if they can't innovate around or through regulation, they don't deserve those multiples. You have a couple of, well, Facebook is the one one trick pony in a social media uh, company, which may not be able to navigate it through any kind of really harsh regulation, but the other ones should. The second issue, and this comes from reading a lot of tech um, writers on this topic, but people who know a lot about the regulatory structures, both here and in Europe, make the point that in order to regulate tech, you've got to get in the weeds. You've got to really understand how these companies work. And if you want to regulate them effectively, you have to get down to the micro level. And I don't think US regulators and politicians have the appetite to do that very much. They kind of want a simple solution, pay a fine or more extremely break them up. But I don't think you're going to see the kind of in-depth scrutiny that you get with, say, European regulation that really, really hurts these companies' ability to be money machines. So bottom line is we're watching it. Regulation is an issue. It's certainly going to be more of an issue now with Democrats in control of the House and Senate and the White House. We're expecting to see something come down the road, but don't think it's fundamentally a threat to these companies. But we totally understand why other people would be more concerned. Question number four, and this comes up, has come up actually a lot over the last 10 years. And I recall having exactly the same conversations about these two topics 10 years ago, and that's what opportunities are there in clean energy and infrastructure? And I'll make this kind of brief. The issue with infrastructure is this really came around in 2009 and 2010 as a big topic in Washington because it was viewed as a way to get a lot of people back to work. And that's absolutely true. It could potentially employ hundreds of thousands of people. But the issue this time around is we, we may not have as big an unemployment problem now as we had in 2010, because once we get widespread vaccine rollouts, the economy should recover. And the roughly 5 million people that are still unemployed uh, should be able to get back to work in large part. So we may not have as big an unemployment problem. And that's a big part of the political appeal and infrastructure packages put in a lot of people to work. If we don't have that problem, less of an issue, less likely it passes. The bottom line on infrastructure is, and I've tracked this issue for a decade, it's just a super hard topic to get anybody to agree on. And so as much as I'd like to see one, and there's plenty of places to put infrastructure spending, like mass transit, 5G, highways, smart roads for autonomous vehicles, recharging stations for EVs, you could spend a trillion dollars and really improve the infrastructure. It's just very hard to get Washington to agree. Now, on clean energy, kind of the same topic. The issue I have with clean energy is a lot of the things we need are still in more of a development phase than actually products that we can buy and use and, and grow with today. So I think if you find good early stage clean energy companies, definitely a place to put money to work, but just be cognizant that you're gonna have to buy five or 10 like a venture capitalist because not all of them will succeed. Now the takeaway here is for a trade for this year, we actually like old carbon-based energy as an investment. We think energy got really beaten up last year. We like large cap energy stocks small cap especially, both Jessica and I own PSCE, which is a small cap energy ETF. And we think that's the kind of group that can really act as a stub equity as the US economy recovers. Now, question five, and I'll use this as kind of our summary point. What's the big picture around this political narrative that we should keep in mind in terms of capital markets behaviors this year? And three points on this. The first is, let's just remember, 
we're in a classic economic recovery post COVID. That's what's happening right now. In that environment, rates go up, energy prices go up, inflation goes up. That's what happens in recoveries. And we're seeing the market correct a little bit today. And we think that's gonna have more of a spill through in the next couple of weeks. We expect a correction like right now, basically. And that's because the market always kind of wrestles with these first waves of other good things that happen in recovery, but that could hurt um, earnings down the road. Totally natural, we're fine, we'll get through it. But that is the narrative that's kind of shifting right now. The second point is, and this is really important, and we do a ton of work on this in our, in our daily notes to clients, the global recovery is gonna be extremely uneven. The US is actually very well placed to be the number one com country to come back strongly from the COVID recession because it spent a lot of money on stimulus, it put in a very aggressive Federal Reserve policies, and our vaccine rollout's going pretty well compared to other countries. So this is going well here. It is also going pretty well in the UK, but they have Brexit, so that's a hit. It's going only okay in China because as much as they did a lot to contain the virus, their consumer confidence just isn't where it was. And we see that in traffic data, we see that in spending data, China is not coming back as fast and Europe is really in last place. Vaccine rollouts have been very slow. And unlike the US, which really took the unemployment hit early on, they basically encouraged their companies to keep all their workers on staff, which was great for the workers, but it really kind of calcified the workforce. So I don't think Europe's gonna come back anywhere near as quickly. So from an investment standpoint, the US is gonna have the most earnings leverage, the quickest of any of these regions. And we like the US stock market over IFA especially, and even EM in many cases, because we see the recovery happening right here, right now and very robustly. Now, the third point is, let's just remember that over the last 24 months, the US stock market is up 54% on a total return basis. Are corporate earnings that much higher? Are rates that much lower? Short answer, no, they are not. It's very hard of a third double digit year of returns. And we just had two in 2019 and 2020. That's the up 54%. <clears throat> Excuse me. But it's very rare to have a third up year of up over 10% in a row. It's only happened after during World War II, during the Korean War, the beginning of the Vietnam War, the dot com bubble, and 2012 through 2014. Very rare. That's like the last 90 plus years. So we're expecting a fairly low return kind of year. And that's an important backdrop to keep in mind as we think about what the political scene is going to do, because in many ways, the stock market has already discounted a lot of the stimulus, a lot of the low rates, a lot of the things we've talked about today. And what we're looking for is basically the flow through to earnings in the back half of this year to really encourage higher valuations for stocks in 2022 and beyond. So the bottom line takeaway here is let's just put it all in context. The politics plays a major issue but we have to put it in the broader context of where the market's been and what's it expecting and be thinking about what surprises are gonna come down the road for good or for bad, but we think for good that generate higher stock prices still, but it's not going to be as easy as we've had in the last year where we had all this stimulus come through and thank goodness a vaccine come through that allows us to be here today. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, Sean. Thank you, Nick, for your presentation. Uh, one question that I have here is that when it comes to uh, this next round of stimulus, the checks in particular, we've read that the checks originally had been used for, say, a little bit of rent, uh, perhaps life insurance. Do you have any idea what the breakdown might be going forward? You think consumers will use it, use this extra money that's uh, we're assuming it's coming, of course, and it will be here for those same things or do you expect maybe the consumer to maybe spend a little more frivolously? Maybe he'll invest in the stock market since it's become so mainstream with Robin Hood making the news and GameStop uh, wealth, if you will. I was just wondering what thoughts were on that. Yeah, it's a fantastic question. There's a lot of work in academic circles done on what, what happens, what investors use kind of found money on. No, look, obviously we have to break this down. If the person is employed, if the household is employed and their basic finances are in good shape, that money tends to go roughly half to spending and half to savings. That savings can easily end up in the stock market. That is clearly a growing piece of the pie in terms of market structure and market participation, obviously happening. 
so the, the and this is by the way is also true of things like tax refunds tax refunds which are kind of like one time quote stimulus check that actually happens every year the data is pretty clear it goes half to spending and half to savings or debt pay down typically what a household does is they ra- run up their credit card bills in december and pay them down with their with a refund check that's the sort of normal cadence of of the way credit flows in this country and the refund checks acts as a way to bring down the credit line now if a household's not employed or financially stressed then obviously some of it goes to savings but a larger chunk of it goes to spending on things that need to happen like rent like food like anything to support the kids in the household for education so the thing that we saw with the $600 checks that I think we replicated with the $1400 checks is about a third of it goes to spending right away. That's kind of the cut that we got from the retail sales data that was out yesterday. You saw big and big spending in home goods. You saw big spending in cars and um, home building, things like that, raw materials for home building. That's probably going to continue with these $1,400 checks. I was looking at Home Depot stock yesterday and, you know, it's doing well, but I think it's probably going to do as well or better if these stimulus checks come out and we do get the spending to Home Depot and any other kind of home goods retailer. The one thing I'd say is department stores are not doing well. Department stores are not getting these refund checks. Department store, same store comps or comps last yesterday in retail sales down 2%. So it's very clear that consumers are spending money in certain places on certain things, but it's not in department stores. And half of all the uptick in retail sales yesterday, half was e-commerce. Like all of the increase, 51% of it went through the e-commerce channel. So that's clearly still a winner. Okay. And the next question is piggybacking a little bit off the last one, and that is the Robin Hood effect, the retail or slash day trader what kind of impact do you see them having going ahead this year in light of the stimulus check or what they've done in the past, say with GameStop and the, the Reddit forums, et cetera? Yeah, it's a super interesting topic. And again, Jessica, my, 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 my partner, our business partner, has done a lot of work on this. And you know, what we have found generally, and I, I want to put this in a larger, larger kind of perspective, uh, because I have sort of 30 years of watching retail investors get involved. I got my start in, re- in retail mutual funds in the 1980s and like the early 1980s at Alliance Capital. So I've seen kind of several waves of how retail investors interface with the stock market and think about stock market investing. And I'd say what's unique about this cohort versus say the 1980s or like the late 1990s where the first wave of retail investing really took off in terms of online you know, TD, Ameritrade, or Ameritrade then, E-Trade, they were running ads in the Super Bowl, encouraging people to, you know, trade tech stocks in 1988 and 1999. So we've kind of seen this movie before. What's different about this now is what I would call the gamification of the stock market through these apps. And you're appealing to a group of investors, a group of traders, who in many ways understand game structure better than prior iterations and prior um, investors. And a lot of them come out of the sports betting world. And so they kind of understand gambling and odds and probabilities perhaps better than say the 1990s cohort did where it was just all internet one no enthusiasm. So the bottom line I think is we're gonna be talking about this cohort of investors for a long time to come. They do have staying power. The new stimulus checks will give them even a little bit more staying power. There will be stories of people, you know, who blow up their portfolios and stories of people who, you know, buy, you know, Lamborghinis the way Bitcoin investors did two or three years ago. We're going to hear about all of that, but I do think that it's going to generate, I don't want to say as much turmoil as GameStop did, because I think, you know, like with the congressional hearings today, we should see some action on some of the more insidious effects of how these things spool up but I don't think it's like a, a passing fad that'll go away as soon as people go out to bars again. I think it's here to stay. Okay, and just one last question I have here, and this person is asking uh, to revisit at, uh, the Fed versus uh, employment uh, debate here. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to know at what point do you see or is your opinion on the, when will the Fed or take some kind of action, whether it be a statement or an actual rate move at the expense of employment during this recovery? Yes, very important question. Um, So we think about this two ways. 
The first is just mechanically. We look at Fed funds futures every day. You know, it's available for free on the CME website. You know, the, the prices are real time and tracked through the day. And you want to look at the uh, 2022 prices. And as of today or last night, when, because we did this for a note for clients last night, the odds of a rate increase next year through October are roughly 10%. But it's clear the market is keying off of this because during the day they were like 15%. And when the Fed minutes came out, those odds dropped in terms of the prices. And it, the market clearly took some cheer from that. So I think there is a structural linkage, maybe algorithmic or maybe human trade or maybe both, between the odds of a rate increase and how soon that happens and the direction of the stock market. And I see it as almost one for one. And it's very important. It's, it's, it's right that it is. If you think back to 1994, think of the market in April 1994. Cyclical has been running for three years. The stock market has been doing well. The Fed went on a very quick rate increase cycle, and cyclicals in the stock market rolled over 20%. It was brutal. I covered the autos in 94, and I went from being like the most popular analyst in the system to like barely be able to get on the morning call because that's how quickly cyclicals rolled over. So the market understands once the Fed begins to even whisper about Fed rate increases, market's going to get hit and, and hit pretty hard. And the Fed's going to have to condition the market to understand they're going to have to do it at some point. But the short answer is it's not going to be anytime soon. As to the question of the linkage, I don't think it's actually unemployment rates. I think it's participation rates that matter. Un, you know, participation rates took a big hit. That's the percentage of people who could work who are actually look, working or looking for work. But it took a two-point hit, and participation rates were the great success story of the late 2010s. Participation rates have been in decline since 1999, and they finally began to tick higher from 2016 to 2019. It's why Jay Powell talks so much about that economy, because it wasn't just unemployment was low. It was people were actually entering the workforce who had not been in the workforce for many, many years, maybe even a decade big success. He wants to get back there, which means running a super hot economy that literally soaks up workers like a sponge soaks up water. And so it isn't just the number, like 4%, 3.5%, doesn't matter as much as does he see participation getting back, or at least starting to climb quickly back to where it was before. And Janet Yellen, I think, feels exactly the same way. It is participation rates that matter just as much or more as unemployment. So short answer, it's not going to be for a while. They really want participation to get back up, but watch those Fed funds futures. Watch them every day. Put them on your Bloomberg, get them on your web, web screen, and just leave them there. Super important. All right, Nick, thank you. I don't see any more questions in the queue. So again, thank you very much, Nick, for coming and doing this research call. This concludes this month's CAPIS research call. Our next call is slated for March 18th, and I'll be featuring Katie Stockton of Fair Leads. So we invite everyone to stay tuned for updates on our website. On behalf of all the Capus family, thank you all very much for watching and have a great trading day. Bye-bye.